What's up, Real Life Church? How you guys doing? Man, are you guys ready to take some ground from Satan today? Get into the Word, do some cool stuff? Um, man, you guys don't sound very excited out there. There's two, three. We'll get there. We'll get there. We're going to work, keep working on you guys. Hey, a couple things I want to celebrate before we dive in today. Uh, one is this. Uh, life groups, obviously, we've been celebrating it. This is the last week of this semester, and I just think we could give some honor to honors due. Uh, we have an amazing team of life group leaders that have just uh, opened their homes, uh, gotten snacks. I mean, just done the whole nine yards, been pouring out their heart and soul in the people. And so if you're a life group leader, would you please stand up? Let's honor these people for all the hard work. I see some people. Life group leaders, where are you at? Don't be scared. Don't be scared. They're floating around. Thank you so much for all you do. Seriously, it's the heart and soul. I think it's the, the most thing you can do like Jesus. Uh, that's really where the church happens. I mean, we do on Sunday. We get to celebrate, encourage, inspire, you know, talk about God's word. But ultimately, like having relationships where people help you down the path is where God's going to use you most. So I want to say thank you for that. I also want to thank you to our life group coach. Uh, Diane has just torn it up. She has pretty much put this all together, had a vision for it, heart for it. Uh, this is my holy hottie, my spiritual fox. Get up for Diane right here. She just couldn't do it without you, babe. She's being shy. So that's false humility. She's, she's loving on the inside. So she don't ever call me out again, Sean. Um, I also say thanks to, uh, to Drew and Holly Holcomb. They, they leave more life groups and just something's cool that's coming up, just their heart and passion to serve our community. And I uh, just kind of came across my plate randomly, but they had a heart to say, hey, let's get out, let's get in the community. And so tomorrow night, their life group's gonna go out to Heart and Hands Ministry, uh, do some painting, a little bit of remodel, just really just pouring into them. And so I think it's really cool as a church, I mean, it's, it's missional, it's why we exist. And so I thank you guys for doing that. Thank you for having the heart. Uh, as, as a church organization, I mean, you just bleed in the mission. And so Thank you for putting that together. I know it's going to go well. If you run out of supplies, you call up Jerry or just kidding. You call me up. We'll get out there. Um, but we love you guys. Give him a hand for doing that. That's just so cool what God's doing through that. So last thing, last thing I want to celebrate. Uh, there's a man uh, leads a life group. Uh, he's a part of our life groups. Uh, his name is Steve Barrett. He's not here today. He's working. So uh, I have a picture I'll throw up there for you. So Steve's the, uh, he's the guy that looks like Moses. Um, the one, the one that actually, the, the one on the right that looks like most, I'm just kidding. Um, so Stevie's an awesome guy. He's been a, a, a friend in my life for a long time. But we've been through a lot together. And this has been awesome to see what God has done in his life. Uh, this has lasted, since we've really launched a church, maybe a couple months before that, he has had like this wind in his sail. I mean, not contrary, but like just pulling him closer to God. He is on fire for Jesus. I will say today, more than any day I've ever known him, he is more in love with Jesus than today than ever. And so it's been cool to watch what he's doing. He's written a book. Can you believe that? Like, that's, that's, a, that's crazy. Like, who writes a book, right? So he's just like, man, I'm writing this book for Jesus and how it's really how to go through trials. And he's just been on his heart. He's trying to get it published and do stuff. And so he piloted that book in our life groups, which is really cool. He wants to use it to minister to people, and they're going to continue to kind of go through that. And I still say this, is that he is doing spe something special for Father's Day for us. Uh, he is just an amazing man of God. His family's that way. And him and his dad have a really unique relationship. And so, uh, believe it or not, uh, spoiler alert, he wrote his dad's funeral. His dad's not dead. His dad wanted to write his funeral to go over it with him already. His dad's not, like, dying. But he loves his son. says, son, I want you to do my funeral when I pass away, and I want you to just talk about lessons I taught you. And so they worked on it together, put it together, and, and so he wants to speak this Father's Day, he is speaking this Father's Day, and he wants to include you guys in the story. So we're putting together this booklet, and it's really about the lessons that our dads taught us. And so he's just in this writing fury, and so I'd be love to get stories from your guys' life to put into the book that is going to be printed and passed out to everybody here as a way of encouragement on Father's Day. So you guys do that for me? Can you go to reallifechurchkc.com, just click on the button and just tell your story. Now, don't have to be anything crazy. I mean, maybe your story about my dad, my dad taught me to fish. That's awesome. You spend time with your dad. Uh, it could be anything. It could be something uh, just fun, something serious, something, whatever your story is, we'd love to hear it. Uh, it's encouraging to see what dads teach us. And this is for sons and daughters, amen? Uh, our dads are making a huge uh, influence in our lives, and we just want to be encouraging to people. And Father's Day is a really special time in the heart of the church, and so I'm excited for what God is doing to him. So he's not here to celebrate, um, but he'll watch this video. So give him a big hand so when he watches it, he knows we love him anyway. So shout down for Steve Baird. There you go, Steve. I'm telling you, it's encouraging to watch what God's doing in his life. But today we, we're launching into a new series called Different. It's a four-week series. We're going to study through the book of First Peter, just learn about what it is to be a Jesus follower and to be different from the world. So let me give a little context to First Peter. What's it really all about? What's in the storyline? So I'm going to start out like for a simple question. Uh, I'm just going to tell you who wrote First Peter. Anybody have a guess? Who said Peter? Wrong. I'm just kidding. You're right. So 
spoiler alert, <laughs> Peter wrote Peter, that's crazy. Um, so just to give a little context of what Peter was going through, a lot of times you think Peter is just uh, this uneducated fisherman, just kind of aloof. You see him in the Bible where he's young, he's just taking ground, he's passionate, like I could do anything Jesus, he's, he's the guy that cut off the ear, I mean, he's the guy that's in the inner circle of Jesus, and so many times you kind of get a bad rep, like he's just that dude. And you know, so many times in life that people that aren't formal educated are really the smartest people, you know? And he went on to, to, to really lead the way. He was the, really the Jesus, the foundation of the church, but he was the forerunner of the church. Uh, he was a leader in the inner circle of Jesus. And God used him with boldness and courage to further the cause of Christ. And so just kind of look into his life. He's writing to a, a group of Christians, uh, and he uses words that we may not use all the time, like divine election and foreknowledge, sanctification, obedience. He's talking about the blood of Christ. And it really comes down to two major themes. And the one, first theme is this, the hope we have in Christ. Time and time again, Peter is encouraging the church to the hope we have in Christ. And the second thing is this, that we're not called to this world. That we're called to be different. That we're called out of this space. Over and over again, these are two themes. So I want to look a little deeper because it's really significant to know uh, why Peter wrote this book. It's really significant to know the culture that he was in. And so this book is uh, written between A.D. 60 and A.D. 65, and so it's kind of debated like in that time period. But we do know what was going on. There's a really evil, um, just kind of corrupt, selfish, um, very almost demonic leader um, that you'd know as Nero. He was an emperor in Rome and uh, was a very persecuting to the Christians. And during this reign, uh, you know Nero's story, uh, he killed his own mother. Uh, he killed his first wife. Uh, allegedly, okay, it says in history they killed his second wife. So these marriages aren't going too well. And I keep getting married to this guy. And in 64 AD, the city of Rome was burned. Uh, it burned for six days, and then it was kind of put out, but reignited for three more. So nine days, the city of Rome was on fire, and uh, historians uh, they pretty much conjure up that Nero wrote or burned down his own city because he was just insatiable about building stuff. He really had a passion and lust to keep building, but the Senate told him no. So he said, hey, if you can't let me build, I'm just going to burn some stuff down to build it. But when this happened, Nero did something crazy. Uh, he blamed this small group of people, you might have heard of them, called the Christ Ones, uh, the Jesus followers that were already hated at that time. So he blamed the Christians for all the pain and suffering that was happening. And so the Christians became the center of persecution. And so Peter is writing to this group of people. Nero was one of those guys that would take animal skins from animals and wrap them on the Christians. He would lock them in cages and have wild animals, wild dogs, attack the Christians and kill them for fun. Kind of like you see Gladiator, they'd be sitting back drinking their parties and killing Christians. He actually went to the expedient of making people suffer. He'd dip Christians in hot wax, and this is crazy, and he would tie them to trees and light them on fire to help light parties he was having with his friends. So this guy is obviously ridiculous. He's obviously a, a tool that Satan is using to persecute the Christian church. And so what's this, what's this message about? Like, who's it for today? And I'd say it's for two groups of people. One is somebody going through a trial. Maybe you're in a season in life where, you know, it's just not happening, right? Like, it's just so uncertain. I know for us, we walked in through a trial, you know, we're, we're dying, could not get pregnant. You know, we're, we're struggling through infertility. You know, maybe you're in a season where you're not in a job, right? You've just been let off and you're like, okay, God, what are you doing? Maybe it's financial struggle. Maybe it's some in your family. Maybe there's a teenager that just is walking away from God. Maybe he's walking away from you guys. You just don't know what to do. Like, this is, this is who it's for. It's a book written for people that are suffering. It's a book written for people that are hurting. A book written for people that are battling something real. Maybe it's a cancer. Maybe it's a health concern. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe they just feel helpless. And so the second group people it's written to is everybody that's about to go into a trial. Amen. It's so all the rest of us, right? We're going to get there. I remember the preaching growing up, and you're coming into a storm, you're in a storm, you're going out of storm, and there is that season of life, right? There's always a trial coming, there's always opposition, and so Peter is writing really to all of us. And it starts out this way, it says in Peter, 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, it says, this letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners. Somebody say foreigners. foreigners. We can do better. Foreigners. Let's hear it. Foreigners. foreigners. All right, so... Foreigners, and this is the province of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so the Greek word for foreigners here is really aliens, strangers, sojourners, these foreigners. They're not, they're not really there. You're not in the moment. This, you're not of this world. And you think of us as Christians, so many times we're focused on the insignificant temporal things around us. And Peter is saying, hey, look, you're a foreigner, man. This isn't your land. This is a heavenly, this is a heavenly body. You know, this is, this is a heavenly spirit. Like, we're not born in this world and stay in this world. This is a, something we pass through. Don't fall in love with it. This is temporary, not eternal. And because you're not from here, we live different, amen? 
We have different values. We have a different, different way of seeing life. We have things that matter to us, matter different than the world. We're not going to look like the world. We have different standards. Like our ideas of life are different. We have different goals, amen? We have different things that drive us because we're not part of this world. And so as a mom, you're called to be different. And as a dad and as a, as a child and as you're raising kids, as you go to work, you know, as you deal with that crazy employee that you can't stand, you want to lock in a padded room, right? Like you deal with it differently. As, as you invest your money, you invest it differently. As you post on social media, amen, we post differently for Jesus. We do things differently. We spend our time differently because this isn't our home. We're not from here. We're not staying here. This is something we're just walking through. And so we're not called to look like the rest of the world. We're called to live, some might know it, different, amen? We're called to live different. So look at the trials that, that Peter is talking about trials. And what, what are we supposed to do in our trials? What's the point of the trials? And, and Peter says this uh, in verse 6 and 7. And this may appear shocking when you read it, but it says, So be truly glad. So he starts the passage. So, hey, I know your friends are getting burned and you have family members that are being outcast. I know this is like when you become a Christian, you have a mark on your head that your life expectancy has just dropped. Your quality of life has been completely stripped out. Hey, but when you're doing that, I want you to be truly glad. Wow. I mean, is that how we feel about our trials, right? Like, can you imagine like the, the obstacle, the enemies around you, when you have an enemy, be glad. When you're suffering, be glad. Can you imagine, what, what is Peter thinking here? Like, what is it going through his head? And he says this, There is a wonderful joy ahead of you, even though you must endure many trials for a while. What it's basically saying is this, God's not going to take away the trial. God's not going to pull it out of your life, but Satan cannot rob your joy. Like, just because there's a trial in your life doesn't mean you have uh, this absence of joy because there's something we're looking forward to, amen? Like, we can endure in the race. Like, we can, we can push through hard stuff because there's something at the end that's worth it. And so it says this in verse 7. These trials show us that, show us that your faith is genuine, that there's a genuine faith. So when you're, trial, when you're tested through trials, it shows your genuine faith. But if there's genuine faith, there's also what? False faith, right? There's real faith, and then there's false faith or fake faith. And so to, if you look at it today, like in our church, like in just America, uh, you know, across the world, you become a Christian, maybe in a Muslim country, and all of a sudden, you better leave the country. You, you better go into hiding, you know. In, in China, there's underground churches. You know, the main place in the world where you become a Christian, all of a sudden, it's, it's very inconvenient. It's very hard. It's very difficult. You have true loss and meaning, you know. And here in the Bible Belt, because we are, might, might be in the buckle of the Bible Belt, right? <laughs> like, it's so easy to be a Christian, it's so easy. Like, it costs us, like, what? For some of us, it may cost us, like, two hours a week. Like, we just show up, and we can just do that. And it's easy. Like, it's easy to hide. It's easy to float. It's easy to be a part of the Christian culture. It's easy just to, to feel good about it and just and feel, feel like it's all about me and, and not have any real sacrifice. And it's my fear, like, and I think a lot of pastors and leaders in the church, like, hey, what's it really taken for the gospel to go forward? Like, our idea of persecution is somebody didn't like me. <laughs> You know, somebody made a comment on Facebook, my, fr my friend, man, my friend. But we don't step out. We don't push. We don't move forward. And so many times it can be easy to go to church with a fake faith or a false faith and not have the real genuine faith of Jesus. You know, it can be easy. In, you know, it's getting kind of quiet in here, I guess. <laughs> Am I stepping on some toes? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not you know, trying to step on your toes. But that's just the reality. Like, it's easy to show up and, and not take that next step. And so I just want to look at three false faiths just real quick. And, uh, and I think God has you here on a purpose because he's going to take you from these false faiths into a genuine faith with Jesus today. So first thing that you see a false faith is this inherited faith. You know, my, honestly, this is my story. My dad's a Catholic. I didn't grow up in the Catholic church because my mom's a Methodist, so they wouldn't have all that, right? And so I wasn't a Buddhist. I wasn't a Muslim, but, well, I guess I was a Christian, right? <laughs> like, we had one of those big holy Bibles, you know what I'm talking about, like, 15 inches thick, it's white, like, you know, it doesn't fit in the shelf, so you got to turn it sideways. Like, that made me a Christian. It had some cool pictures in it, you know, way to go, all the people who did all that cool stuff. You know, I mean, we, we just grow up, and that's just all around us, but we inherit that, right? I mean, how many times have I talked to a young person that goes off to college, and all of a sudden, they see that first professor who says, God's not real, there's no absolute truth, they throw it up on the screen, you get that new boyfriend, and life's around you different, and all of a sudden, it's like, man, I don't know if I believe all this stuff. That's inherited faith. It's not your faith yet. You haven't owned your faith. That's just a faith that's just kind of like you grew up. And for many of us, that's our story. Like my, my grandma and then, then my dad and, and then me. And by the time it gets to me, like we go to church when somebody either dies or gets married. And if somebody, my friend invites me. And that's just how it works, right? We have a lot of inherited faith. 
The second type of faith is shallow faith. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 13. We have the sower that sows seeds and he throws it on the ground and out of the ground sprouts these, these little plants and these roots don't get deep enough and so the pleasure of the world entices us of wealth, of, of just deceitfulness of the world around us and it chokes out our faith because the roots aren't deep. And for many of us, we have this faith where it's just, just barely there. Like, just barely have it. And so for some of us, we go to church, but in six months, if you've been in church for a while, which I'm not just talking about this church because we haven't been around that long, right? Some of you, I'm talking to you, just kidding. But you grew up in church, you know people come, and then six months later, you're like, where did that person go? Who? What? They came, they came twice, you know? They, they're here for a time and, and left. And for us, some of us in this room, I mean, I hate to say it, but that's us, Right? Like we have some of this faith that's just not deep enough yet. And so as soon as something gets in our face, like we get that new friend or we get that new job that has us working every single Sunday, we get that new promotion, we get that new thing, and, and it, we, just, we forget about Christ. We forget about the things in front of us, and it draws us out of the things of God. You know, I have a buddy from college, and uh, he's asking about church on Facebook, you know, and he's like, man, I love it. It's so cool what God's doing. I'm like, God's awesome, dude. How's church for you? And uh, well, I've been gone like three or four years. I'm like, Okay, well, we went to this thing, and it's weird. It's called Bible College. <laughs> you don't need a degree to know that one, you know? And just totally walked away. And that's the story of so many people that I went to school with, even. And that's, I mean, that's like the people who wanted to pay for Jesus, you know? <laughs> I mean, the rest of us were like, we're just kind of going. I mean, how easy is this just to walk away, right? Because the faith isn't really ours. It's not really mine. It's just something we do. Just, just enough. Just enough to get by. You know, that's why I really encourage you to jump into a life group. I mean, you can come on Sunday, and it's fun, and we have all this cool stuff and all that, but you really don't grow deep. Like, you don't go deep until somebody's in your life. Like, you can't have leadership without a relationship. Like, you can't grow without intimacy. You can't do, do something deeper without somebody really looking into your life. You've got to get your knees under somebody's table, and you've got to be able to just talk. Somebody's got to know your middle name, know what you're struggling with. You've got to be open with them. You've got to have a, a transparency. And it's not going to happen here on Sunday morning. So really, the work of the church is happening in our life groups. That's like the most like Jesus you could ever be, is jumping into a life group. You know, for some of us, we need to take a step forward before the devil takes us out. Amen? Like, we're kind of just floating in there. It's like, man, one, one move on the devil's part, one move off, off of Jesus. And we're just like, man, I guess that was cool for a time, but it's not really for me. But, you know, God has so much more for you, and so I encourage you to jump in. Uh, there's something we were training through. We were planting a church, and I heard this at one of the art conferences. It's been um, the last one before this. But they said this comment to us as church planters. They said, hey, listen, pastor, you're only as healthy as your secrets. <laughs> I mean, it's like getting pimp slapped by the Spirit, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, all right, what does that mean? Oh, perfect, you know? Like, there's just stuff inside me that's not good, right? There's stuff inside all of us that's just not going to take us somewhere righteous, somewhere holy, somewhere good. And without people in my life that I'm saying, hey, you have permission to ask me anything you want. You have permission to ask me these. Here's why I'm struggling, bro. Like, you've been down the road. Like, help me out. Like, you need those relationships. And that's what's happening life on life, that there's secrets in our life that we can entertain and just pull us far from God because we really just are drawn away from him. And so having people in your life that love you and care about you helps. And so that's shallow faith. The third type of false faith is conditional faith. Now, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. How about you? You have every chance to, I love God, all this stuff, until it, until it does something I don't like. I love Jesus until something doesn't go my way. I love Jesus till it gets hard. I love Jesus till my car doesn't start and I have no money. I love Jesus till my girlfriend starts dating me. She doesn't love Jesus and I like her body. <laughs> you know, I love Jesus, but I don't love Jesus that much. Like we have this conditional faith. As long as it's going good, then it's good. But once it gets bad, then it's all God's fault. And we're not really prepared to take that next step because it's our faith is just an inch deep. And so Peter is going to talk to us. What, what does it look like to follow Jesus? And I believe for some of you, God has brought us here through the trials. Maybe these faiths are sticking out to you. Maybe like, hey, kind of step on my toes a little bit there, pastor. I'm not coming back next week. I'm just kidding. But step on my toes. But God wants to have genuine faith. Like, how do you get deeper? Like, how do you get some genuine faith in your life? And so here's what Peter's teaching us about the trials. There's two things. One is this, that trials reveal your faith. It says in verse 7, these trials will show your faith is genuine. Man, a faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. Man, if you haven't been through something hard with Jesus yet, you don't know what it's like to trust Jesus yet. Like, God's going to push you through that. And so I want you to just look at Peter's life a little bit. I mean, he wrote the book, right? And his story is crazy. Like, this guy, he, he was young, immature. I mean, you would have thought, straight-up teenager. 
I mean, just, just passionate, doing his thing, like failed all the time. And so, but he was regrouped, man. He came back to what God wanted. And I want you to look at verse, uh, Luke 22, verse 31 through 32. This is Jesus talking to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, that means Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And so Jesus says, hey, Peter, uh, you know, Satan wants to kind of see what you're made of. Like Satan wants to see how much, how much trust you really have in God. And so Jesus says this. He said, I've prayed for you, Simon, that's Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. When you turn back to God, strengthen your brothers. Because Jesus is really just telling them, hey, you're going to go through some hard stuff. There's going to be some trials and you're going to fail. It's not going to go well. There's going to be some pressure you can't handle. And I want you to come back and I want people to turn to me. So how does God use trials to transform Peter? I mean, look at his early life. I mean, you follow the Gospels. What's Peter doing? He's got his foot so far down his mouth all the time. I'll never forsake you, Jesus. And he's the first one to run, right? You know the story where the little girl, with the second grader with the Snoopy lunchbox, you know, goes up to him and says, hey, aren't you one of Jesus' buddies? And Jesus... I don't know that dude. Aren't you from Galilee? Galilee what? I've never heard of that. And he's lying to this little girl because he's afraid of what's going to happen to him. And he locks eyes with Jesus as he's carrying his cross. And Peter's ashamed. And Peter's at his bottom. Hits his rock bottom. And Jesus does something crazy in John 21. He meets with Peter and says, hey man, do you love me? Yeah, I love you, Jesus. Then feed my sheep. I'm restoring you. Like, you can't ever run so far from me that I won't care about you. There's stuff you're going to fail. You can't do on your own, Peter. I know you think you're strong. I know you thought you weren't going to fail, but you're going to fail. But I'm stronger than your trial. You just got to trust me. You got to look your eyes on me. You can't just do this on your own, Peter. That's how you get faith. That Jesus is going to speak into that moment of weakness. He's going to speak in that moment of when you're broken. And he's going to speak some words of grace. He's going to speak some words of love into your heart. I want to tell you something. You got to thank God for your trial. Amen. I mean, there's things in my life that, I, like, honestly, I thought were going to crush me. Like, I thought I was going to quit. Like, I was depressed. I was upset. There's things I've been through that I'm like, man, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And i got to come out and say, man, God is good. God is good. God is faithful because I know God's teaching me something in the trial. And so don't hate your trial. Don't hate your soul. Amen. Like, don't, don't hate your problem. Don't hate the thing out there. Don't be mad at it. Thank God for it. Matter of fact, kind of all joy. Be glad that things in your life. Be glad it's difficult. Be glad things are, are not working well. Find the peace in, behind the problem. The Bible says this, that in James 1, 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face many trials, because you know that testing your faith produces perseverance. Man, Jesus will never waste your pain. I know you're thinking you're in the middle of it, like this is never going to end. I can't handle it. It's not going to work out. I'm going to tell you something. The Bible never promised us that we can handle anything. It doesn't say that. I know many times we talk about that, like, hey, man, Jesus never gave you more to handle. Jesus never gave you more to handle. Matter of fact, what the, the verse says is Jesus never tempt you more than you can bear. It doesn't say he's going to give you more you can handle. I believe that God gives you more to handle all the time because we can't do it on our own. Amen. Like, we have so much pressure on our shoulders, we can't move forward. Like, we can't do it in our own strength. It would be false faith. I wouldn't need Jesus. And so many times in life, I remember stepping in as, as, a, as a young married couple taking in foster kids at 24 and just seeing their life of what Satan has wrecked. I remember growing up and parents are split and I didn't know it was weird at all until I got older. <laughs> you know, I was like, whoa, that was, wow, that was a little different than what should have happened. And Satan had a path, right? And I, I see the stories of what, G, what, what Satan has done and he wants to divide and take us apart. But God uses that pain when he puts the pressure that's overwhelming you. When you're in a situation you can't control. You guys been there, right? Am I preaching to somebody today? Is there somebody out there I'm preaching to? Somebody get something out of this? Like, is it speaking to your heart? I just want you to see what God is doing, that he wants you to have pure joy. He's not going to waste the pain you're in. The second thing is this, is that their trials draw you closer to God. It says in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, it says, You love God even though you've never seen him. You love him, you haven't seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust in him. Peter, you trust in him. You rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. You know, when you follow Jesus through the trials, you know, there's no really humanly words you can put. There's no human words you can express the joy you feel from God. I remember walking through the hardest moments, the hardest seasons of my life, and I can't go into details, it's all too fresh, right? It's all too close, all too personal, all too many things. But I can tell you, in the middle of it, there was a joy. There was, there was something that I just knew was not from here. Like this place was temporary. Like this place isn't my home. This isn't my, my destination. This is a journey, and I believe God calls us all on a journey, and the only way we really get started is if God puts some pressure, God puts a trial, God puts a thing in our life to move us. The Bible says this, the reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your soul. Man, that's good news. 
It's good news. The Bible doesn't say that God is going to, if you trust in him, that, the, that he's going to take you from your trials. The Bible says he's going to save you from your sin. Amen. Like God's not going to save you from trials. There's nowhere in the Bible that God said he's going to save you from having migraine headaches. He's going he's gonna to save you from, from, from going through cancer. He's going to save you from going through difficult trials in your life. That's not what the Bible says. matter of fact, in fact, it says the complete opposite. In John 16, it says that Jesus said in this world you will have trouble. I mean, this is an amazing message. Right? We're talking about negative stuff here. But it says you'll have trouble. You'll find trouble in this life. But take heart for I will overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world, not from this world. Jesus never promised us that we wouldn't have financial stress. Huh? Who's got that, right? Like Jesus never promised us that the next day would be easy. Jesus never promised us a job. Jesus never promised us a safe home or an environment. Jesus never promised us it wouldn't have loss. Jesus never promised us that our reputation wouldn't be torn down by somebody else. Jesus never promised that you'd be understood by people. Jesus never promised to have 5,000 likes on Facebook. <laughs> Jesus never promised that this life was gonna be anything special, it was gonna be anything different than the road he carried his cross down. But we did promise this salvation of our sin that Jesus went to the cross for our sin and paid the penalty that overcame the things of the world. That one day he has the victory. He, we are fighting from victory already. That Jesus has already fought these battles. And we just have to focus on him and put our faith in him and move forward with the plan he has for our life. That's the good news of the cross. You know, God won't give you more than you can handle only when you trust him. Because the pressure isn't something you hold. It's something that Jesus holds for you. Like when you're going down a tough road, you're not called to carry the weight. You gotta give it to God. And the moment you give your trial to Jesus is the moment your life changes. The moment you give away that thing that's just been on your heart, that's been ripping, that's been keeping you up at three in the morning, that thing that cries you to sleep at night, that thing that bothers you, that thing that just, just irritates you no end, that thing that hurts you, the moment you give that thing to Jesus, it's no longer you that's holding it up. And that's what it's all about. So Peter's like, man, count of joy. This isn't your problem, folks. God's got it. And I'm convinced that we can depend on Jesus, that in our weakness, that Jesus is gonna speak redemption. In my moments of pain, I realized I was just still living for myself. I was mad because I lost control. I was mad because I lost reputation. I was mad because I lost a vision. I was mad because I didn't get what I wanted. And I realized it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This isn't my life. This isn't my journey. You know, I believe this, the harder you press into God, the easier it is to rejoice with an inexpressible joy. You just press into Jesus and give your life to Him. You know, why am I passionate about this? I mean, if you've been through something painful, you might be passionate about it, right? And for me, it's just personal. It's just personal. There's been story after story after story in my life and probably like most of our lives, we've been through hard stuff, amen? We struggle, we've been through the pain, we've been through the experience, and I know what it's like to see Satan just move through people and we focus on the problem, but not the Savior. And for me, you know, I was told my story a little bit about having foster kids at 24, and I, I know what it's like to, to literally sit there and not have answers. I mean, I know what it's like to give away my, my, my youthful years to other people. I know what it's like to watch them struggle from the pain that other people put in their life. And as much as a parent wants to take that from their kid, right, you want to carry their burden and take their burden and yell, you can't do it. I know it's like to sit there in the middle of the night wondering if your kid is going to be alive the next morning. I know it's like to, to wait on the phone call. I mean, I know it's like to carry somebody in that's struggling that literally don't know if they're even going to live. I mean, I know it's like to really deal with some demons. I know it's like. It's tough. There's no answers. There's nothing we can do except for trust Jesus because Jesus has overcome. In our family, like in those darkest moments, in the years and years and years of grind, welcome to parenthood, there was something that we had bigger than ourselves. Because no matter what we did, this wasn't our home. This is not our home. We live different because we're on a journey. We live different with the joy. We, we know that the future is different in heaven. We know that God isn't gonna just use that pain and just waste it. I mean, he's gonna use the pain that happened in people's lives. God's gonna use everything you have for his glory. God's gonna take your worst moment and use it for his greatest asset. He's gonna take the hardest thing you ever did and prepare you for something greater. When you're overlooked, when you're passed over, when, you, when somebody notice you, when somebody speaks something down on you, 
when something was said about you, when somebody lied about you, when you lost something, when you can't control something, when the enemy is taking ground and you have nowhere to go, Jesus is gonna whisper something in your ear. He said, do you love me? To feed my sheep. Let's go. Because if I got this ground already, son, I've got what you're looking for. You just need to follow me to sit in your problem. Just pray, just pursue, just go. God's not gonna take the trial out of your life, but God's gonna use it to change you. That's the story of grace. That's the story of what God's called us to do. We're called to live different. We don't look down because we're in a hard season. We look up, amen? The future's brighter on the other side. And so, yes, it's tough, but you know what? We gotta take as many people to heaven as we can, amen? Like we're called to be in the dirt. We're, ta- we're called to get dirty. We're, we're called to be in the fray. We're not called to be comfortable. That's the problem. We want it to be easy. We want the Christian life to just look simple and to, to make sense and to, to get us where we want to go and to, to be something we add to everything else, but it doesn't work that way. God wants you to strip everything off and say, Jesus plus nothing. I remember just the other night, just thinking through this and go, man, what in the world am I into? It's like, dude, it's not about you, bro. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. We used to talk about Jesus period, Jesus plus, I'm not preaching to somebody. Jesus period, that's what it's all about. Now it's like, hey, what can you do to have authentic faith? Man, you gotta turn to Jesus. 